part of his fellowship. I went so long to some memorial service Jewish church leaders or no, no, I think we may have been watching Yeah, he used to. Good evening. Welcome to everybody. My name is Terry Henry. I'm the vice chair of Catering in the Bay Forum. And uh, very warm welcome. And today's topic for the interfaith lectures is going to be about prayer from the different faith perspectives. So we have uh, uh, four panelists today. And we're at the Haven Islamic Cultural Center, which is the main mosque in Haven. There will be different perspectives on prayer from faith speakers. Then we'll be having a break before listening to remaining speakers. We will then end up with an interactive question and answer session. And I will introduce uh, Mr. Mike Stenard, Salvation Army, in Rockford. Well, good evening, everybody. It's good to be here. It's my first time to come to your centre. I'm here to speak a little bit about prayer. Now, I look around the room and I'm sure there's going to be a multiple ideas of, uh, of prayer, but I would think essentially for all of us, it's the same thing. It's about our communion with our maker, with our God, and um, how we live with him and how he lives in us. And from the Christian point of view, um, from the Salvation Army point of view, I, I, I should say, we are very much into the, the free form of prayer, uh, which is more spontaneous prayer, what we would consider to be led by the Holy Spirit. And our, our relationship with the Lord is a private, personal relationship, but we do have communal opportunities for prayer as well. But from the individual point of view, it's our responsibility as an individual to maintain and develop our relationship with God under the guidance of um, um, well, his Holy Spirit so that we are able to uh, communicate with him and be friends with him. That's the way we interpret how our prayer is. When we come together in a communal situation, like when we're having our worship on a Sunday, then our prayer tends to be a little bit more formal. Um, we do use liturgical prayer on occasions, but it isn't the core element of our prayer time. We do have liturgical prayer. That is prayer that has been written down by a spiritual leader and the, and the congregation um, either read it together when it's up on the screen or in a prayer book in front of you. Um, uh, or it might be a responsive prayer where the, the worship leader is reading part of the prayer and then we respond with part of the prayer. But we tend to, like I said earlier, we tend to look more to the informal prayer, where, which is a little bit freer. We might use scripture um, within both the liturgical, liturgical prayer or in the, the responsive prayer or in our creed prayer. Um, it might be that we wish to use the word of God to help focus our minds and our hearts on, on some element of scripture, and then we will allow free prayer to, to continue from that. Now, on the liturgical side of things, uh, th there's pluses and minuses for us. Um, sometimes liturgical prayer can be a little bit dead, it can be a little bit formal, it can be a little bit lifeless, but so can spontaneous prayer also can have those um, dead moments where people are just spouting words for the sake of spouting words uh, and somehow has lost the spirit. But our real emphasis on prayer is about opening ourselves up to the spirit of God so that we can <coughs> glimpse some part of his glory, glimpse some part of his nature, understand something of him that we're not always aware of when we're just living our daily lives. So we have our personal private prayer, and that might take many forms. That might be that we pray at a special time of day. Um, I don't mean set periods. I know with some faiths you have a set time in the day in which you will pray, maybe more than once. 
um, in the Christian faith, in some parts of our tradition, there will be set times of the day people will pray. But um, in the Salvation Army, which is part of the, the free church, the Protestant side of the uh, of the, the Christian faith, the, the multiple facets that we have in our faith, um, we tend not to pray at a specific time at any given time. It, it might it might differ. Some people will pray in the morning, some people will pray at night time, some people will pray on their knees by the side of their bread, uh, by the side of their bed in, a, in an attitude of prayer. Some people may lay in their bed and pray before they doze off and go to sleep. Some people will meditate, some people will listen to music and allow the music and the words, um, they're usually spiritual words, a spiritual song, a spiritual poem. Um, that will inspire the content of your prayer or just help you to relax and open yourself up to the Spirit of God. But this last Sunday, um, funny enough, coincidentally, if we believe in coincidence, we were speaking about prayer. And we were talking about prayer from the perspective that prayer is an exciting thing. God He's excited to hear our prayers. He's excited to hear us. He wants to hear us like his children. And I look around the room, and many of you will be parents. You are excited to hear what your child has to say to you when they come home from school, or if they're a bit older and they're coming home from work, and they're sharing something about their day. You're excited to hear. You're interested to hear about it. And it's a little bit like that um, when we are speaking to God. We're coming to God with our, with our thoughts, sometimes with our needs. Sometimes we're asking for forgiveness. Sometimes we're asking for um, intercession. We're praying about somebody who's within our family or within our, um, our realm of concern, somebody who's in the church who we're concerned about. Or it might be we're praying for a new prime minister. Um, our prayers have already been answered in that respect. We do have a new prime minister. So in that respect, um, hopefully he's He's been anointed by God or his God, from, if I understand right, he comes from another faith background. But we were talking about how he's excited to hear what it is that we have to say to him. And of course, we are excited when we go to prayer. Now, I can't say that every night when I go into my attitude of prayer, I'm excited about it. Um, sometimes I'm tired. Sometimes my prayer is lazy. Sometimes my prayer is not as thoughtful and, and as considered as it should be. I'm a human being. I have all sorts of moods and my prayers go in phases. Sometimes I'm really attentive. Sometimes I'm not as attentive as I should be. But I'm a free person. I'm a free man. And I'm able to speak to my Lord whenever I want to in that respect. But there are times when my prayer when I'm going to my prayer and I'm going to speak with my God and I go to speak with him about something and I'm expecting an answer. Now we, we have a saying, and my, my colleague David will know this saying, that prayer, when, when, when we pray, there's going to be one of three answers. Yes, he will do what it is we're asking. No, he won't do what it is we're asking. Or wait. Now, of course, the wait one is more to do with his timing than our timing. We want something done now. We want to see something happen now. But it's that element of expectation that when we're speaking with God, and it's not about taking um, and, and asking for something. That's a, there's an element of prayer that that is. But it's more about developing that rich relationship with, with, with our God. And it's more about developing that fellowship and that friendship with him so that he knows who I am and so that I know who he is. And so when I'm praying on these occasions, I'm excited to see the result of my prayer. Because there are occasions when I'm praying, when he reveals something of himself to me. I catch a glimpse of his kingdom. I catch a glimpse of his compassion. I catch a glimpse of his of his word, a class, uh, capture a glimpse of something about his personality. Other occasions when I'm praying, and I'm praying, it could be I'm praying for the condition of my church, the condition of the people that I'm responsible for spiritually. 
And it might be that I know that there are tensions amongst some of the families, or I know that there are needs amongst some of the people because they may be dying, or they may be ill, or they may be going through marital dispute of some kind or another. So when I'm praying in that situation, I'm wanting to know and I'm wanting to see how God is going to respond to that prayer. So I'm excited about it. I want to see what's going to happen. I'm expecting something to happen. Now, I don't mean it's like turning off a light on and off, that I'm going to see something immediately. But I know God is going to answer it. And I'm excited about that. I'm excited to see what he's going to do. On other occasions, I'm praying to him and he's trying to tell me something. And so there are times I have to learn to shut up. I have to learn to keep quiet and I have to learn to receive, not just to be spouting out to him, but to be sitting there in an attitude of prayer, opening my heart and opening myself to him that I may receive something from him because he wants to tell me, he wants me to change. Now that might be I've got to change something within my life that is blocking something of him within me because I'm reticent to change, I'm reticent to open up a part of my life to him. Or it might be that I need to change my perception of something, my perception of somebody, my perception of the world, my perception of my ministry, my perception of life. And that there is something that I need to change. So I'm excited about that. What is it, Lord, you want me to change? What part of me, what, what aspect of my life is at the moment going to be a, a problem. But there's the other side of it as well, that there might be something he, he wants to change within me so that I'm more fruitful, that I'm more effective, that I'm more able to help someone else. And so I'm looking forward to that change. So there's an element that I'm excited about praying because I'm excited to see what the result of that prayer is because we believe that prayer makes a difference. And if it makes a difference, then it must be a personal thing. It makes a difference to me, not just to the world. If I'm the first thing that's changed, then that essentially means that the world has changed because I've changed myself and therefore there is a ripple effect. If I've changed the way I'm interacting with someone else or the way I'm interpreting what God is saying to me is better because I have changed. So from the Salvation Army point of view again, there's a lot of freedom in how we pray. There's a lot of freedom as into when we pray. And there's a lot of freedom in how we do it. And we even believe in the fact that we can actually live our life or live elements of our uh, times of our life, occasions of our life, in an element and an attitude of prayer. So prayer can be something that is not just when it is the special time to pray, whether that is when we're in church and we're worshipping together, or whether that is at night and it's part of our, our prayer routine, our prayer discipline. But there are times that we pray when we're washing up or driving the car. Not, not, you don't want to pray too much when you're driving the car. You've got to focus on the other traffic. You might be praying for the guy who's in front of you, who uses his brakes too much or does some dark things. But uh, the point I'm trying to make is that you can pray doing your everyday thing. So this is how we look at it, is that when you're living your daily life, there are moments in your, in your life when you just feel in tune with God. You just feel that everything is right at that moment in time, with your relationship with God and how he is working through you. And again, you catch a glimpse of something. Maybe he's just spoken to you through somebody else. It may be that... Some he has spoken to you through a something you're hearing on the radio, or maybe he's spoken to you through a word that you have just read in the newspaper or even from your holy book. He has just said something to you. You're not actually kneeling down and you're not actually focusing on, on communing with God, but you're already communing with him through your life. And it's not just that set time, it's that moment that you are open to him. And that's not always something that you can control when he's going to speak to you, just because you have focused. He's completely focused on you all the time, so he might break in at any moment. And our experience, and I would think probably also for David as well, because it's a it's a common understanding in the, in the salvation. 
you know, God can break into you through the Holy Spirit and speak to you at any time of the day so that you are um, trying to live your life in a way that you already live. You, we believe we're already living in God's kingdom because we've already given our hearts to the Lord. And yes, we are living in our physical bodies at the moment, but that doesn't separate us and, and our spirit from the spiritual world because the spiritual world is eternal. And if our spirit is part of that, we are eternal. So that means we can communicate with the Lord and He with us at any time. I think I must be coming towards the end of my time to speak with you. So I will just finish with, um, with the thought that I hope for yourselves as well that there is something of what I've said is common to your own experience. Be excited about prayer, be excited about hearing from God, and be excited that he is excited to hear from you. I know that sounds a little bit childish, but we are his children. So I think that is, is relevant for us. Anyway, I say God bless you, and thank you for listening to me. Thank you very much, Mike, for the presentation and the, the explanation of prayer in the Salvation Army. Are you happy to take questions now? Two or three questions? If there's a quick hand up, I'll accept it, otherwise I'll ask my question. I'm interested in, does your faith include petitionary prayers? Oh, well, Actually asking God to do something, heal somebody. Oh, yeah. uh, Oh, m m most certainly, um, certainly um, both privately but also collectively. You know, I, I, I might pray for my uh, my mother-in-law because she's unwell. Of course, I'll be praying about that. But um, uh, within the, uh, the church setting on a Sunday, we will have um, uh, prayers for, for other members. So, and it won't necessarily be related to a health issue. It could be related to the fact that they're going off to mission. Uh, off to ministry or something of that nature. So yes, I. But I've seen, for example, before a football match, I see people, players pray. You say, how does your God deal with contradictory prayers? If each team is busy praying for success, yeah, well, they it, can't both be successful in a game of skill. Well, it, it depends it's on what they're praying for. In in that respect, are they praying for a goal to be scored? But there's no difference between the uh, 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 different sides of a war, praying for you know, praying to God. Obviously there is the human element there, but from the, the, the spiritual side, the, the, the prayer isn't about who should win, but Lord forgive me for what I'm doing because I can't escape it. Okay. Next question is from uh, Noman. For the place to be answered, do you uh, does one have to face uh, hardship in life, in other words, uh, your uh, your prayers are being You'll be tested in life. Have you followed the rituals of your faith? In other words, have you done everything that's required you to do so? And that way, he might not answer, might not be good enough. So, do you do you have to do your best, basically? Well, I, I, th I think our conscience requires us to do the best that we can because we're doing whatever we're doing for, uh, you know, in the name of our God or for our God. Um, I don't necessarily think pain has to be part of it. Sometimes it is. Sometimes we're low. We're sorry, not low. Sometimes we are slow learners, and sometimes um, the consequences of our, what we would call our sin, our disobedience, um, then it is a painful reminder. You, you know who actually is in charge of this world, and so sometimes the the, the process to learn is slow. But I would say. Um, some of the beautiful things that happen in life are equally as powerful to, to teach us about God uh, and, and the way he wishes us to, to live and express our faith. So pain is part of it, but it's not, it's, it, it's not the only part. One final question from the audience. If not, I'll ask my question over to David. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the church I grew up in, we practice praying in tongues. Um, is that something that the Salvation Army do? Um, as it were, can you short explanations of what that is? Yes, tongues tong is one of the spiritual gifts. We recognize the spiritual gifts within the Salvation Army. Um, uh, and I know many Salvationists and, and Salvation Army officers that do pray in tongues. 
We tend to reserve it more for smaller meetings, smaller groups, so that we avoid confusion. Um, but yes, um, uh, it, it, it is part of the the multicolored facets of uh, of prayer that there are praying in tongues, uh, and uh, people find that uh, very enriching when they're involved in it. But I, I don't have that gift. That's not one of my gifts in that respect. I don't know if my colleague does. Uh, I have one phrase, and it, all it means is God is with me. My wife speaks and prays in tongues quite regularly. Better answer to the question than mine. If there's no more questions, we'll squeeze one more. Hi, yeah, it's a quick question relating to therapy. Don't mind. You just mentioned in my passing remark um, that you. If, if you believe in coincidences, so were you saying you personally don't? No, I don't believe in coincidences. I, I, I think it's oh, sorry. No, I don't believe in coincidences. I, I think there's a purpose that if something happens to look like a coincidence in that respect, that something has happened um, uh, and, and it speaks to you. Well, maybe there's a purpose. I don't believe in coincidences. No, that there's a bigger a bigger thing going on. So in terms of the question there, I've got a very quick uh, definition needed for my uh, ignorant brain, liturgical and the uh, tongues. I'm not sure what that means. But I, I can answer the um, the liturgical one. Well, liturgy is usually when it is written down by a spiritual leader, like a leader of the church. He will write down the prayers and then the congregation will read their part of the prayer and he will read his part. So it's a it's a written it can be very beautiful, it can be very poetic, it can be very dull at the same time as well. But you know, it depends on whether the spirit's involved in it. But as the tongues I, I hand over to my, my colleagues to say more about that. Thank you very much Mike. It's 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 one of those things which is is not guaranteed. I, I don't know if any of you have ever heard of Canon David Watson who went to glory uh, at 44 years of age with cancer, and uh, his family prayed for him and prayed for him and prayed for him. And for years as a cleric, an Anglican vicar, curate before that, he prayed for the gift of speaking in tongues, and nothing happened. But that man was blessed incredibly by the Spirit of God. And it was only in the last couple of years that he started to use the gift of tongues. Now, to define that, um, sometimes as a Christian worshipper, I struggle to say what I want to say. But the Bible tells us that the Spirit intercedes and speaks for us. It's not, I don't control the words. Uh, the one phrase I have is not mine. I didn't originate it. It came from God. When my wife speaks in tongues, as, as Mike has already said, we don't tend to do it corporately. But we do it mostly individually in our prayer times. And so that would define is our relationship with God when the words we have aren't enough that the Spirit intercedes for us. I, I think other people describe it as ecstatic language. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it, it's, it's ecstatic language. It's when you are so caught up in your prayer that it comes out in an ecstatic way. But maybe David has a better description of it. Um, yeah, I'll be trying to share a bit. Thank you. Um, other David sort of summarised it partly. Yeah, so thank you quite well. The the church I grew up in, um, speaking in tongues, you said was a, a gift from God. It was a, a talent that sort of God would give certain people. And it is the act of praying with words that are not your own. Um, often, I don't know, you, you'll often have a feeling when you're, you really want to get something across, but you just don't know what to say. Um, and the English language actually is quite restrictive. You've only got one word for love, for example, but there's multiple words for love. So the gift of tongues would be that um, we believe the Spirit of God is um, being that intercessor between ourselves and God and is putting words into us to express. For some people, it will just be that they're, they're just making, as you say, ecstatic noises. They're just expressing. But I would say it's it's communicating with God from deep within your soul rather from your 
your mouth. It can be very interesting to watch and see, you know, some people, they look like they're just loving it's a bubble, blah, blah, blah. But it's that connection from deep within their soul, communicating directly with them. Thank you for taking the questions as well, the presentation, the comment from the uh, chair. And um, well, without speaking in time, you have to pick your side of the questions because it's so cool in the Bible. It was, was very uneasy about the speaking in tongues. He said it's going to put people off if they come and find you speaking in tongues. So it's a matter of time and place. Thank you very much uh, for the questions and my accepting the questions and answering the questions. We'll move now on to our second uh, then speaker. Uh, Sidra Nain is the secretary of our Hindu Interfaith Forum. She is a Muslim chaplain offers pastoral and spiritual care, mentoring and advice to students and staff from all faith backgrounds in the education of health and retail sectors. In her chaplaincy role at St. Luke's Hospice, Bill is particularly important to offer peace to the dying. Sidra has initiated and assisted in the opening of multi-faith prayer rooms at Chelmsford College, Chelmsford Wednesday, for students, staff, and public. Luther Hospital, St. Paulo Hospice in Chelmsford, and Little College subsequently attending the open ceremonies. Any issues affecting prayer have been resolved and good practice promoted. During COVID, members who started to pray for support. Sidra is a scholar within the Islamic faith, and due to this important role, she has uh, taught many children and adults to pray. Sidra is secretary of the Essex Mountain Spirit, a voluntary organization which aids the recovery of mental health through spirituality and prayer. Now, we welcome Sidra. Right, okay, so this talk is actually aimed at non-Muslims because Muslims already know everything about prayer. However, I am going to take you through some questions to question yourself because a lot of Muslims, they may just pray rote fashion without thinking about it, which is very, very important to think about why we do certain things. Um, so this is the Muslim's perspective. Now, everything is actually created in the world for a purpose. If you think about it, the sun, the trees, the organs of your body, they are all there for a purpose. Everything has a pur purpose, even inventors, they invent inventions for a purpose. And Muslims, they believe that we were actually created to worship God. That is our purpose on earth. There are six stages to our soul. And did you know that the very first stage of our soul is when we were created at the same time as Adam. And when we were created, this is the first stage, uh, what we did was we made a covenant, an agreement with God. And we said that we are only going to worship you and nobody else. This is something that we did when we were created. So when we come on this earth, we forget that promise but that yearning is still there in our soul, which is why materialistic things, they don't satisfy us. We can go on as many cruises as we like, holidays as we like, shopping, eating out, but we're still not happy. Think about pop stars. Think about millionaires who go into binge drinking and commit suicide. They're not happy because our soul feels guilty that we have, we're not worshipping God. We made an agreement we were going to worship him. So before Islam came, even though all the previous prophets were already here, um, people had completely forgotten about God. And Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, then reintroduced the concept of prayer because people had to start remembering God again. People had completely forgotten about God. So people had to start remembering God again. And the concept of praying was reintroduced. 
And it was a big number because Muslims were not praying at all. So God told us to start praying five times a day, a little bit like our five fruit and veg. It says in here, indeed, I am God. There is nothing worthy of worship except me. So worship me and establish the prayer for my remembrance. That is actually in the Quran. So it's five times for a reason so that we remember him the whole day and not just first thing in the morning and then forget about him for the rest of the day. We continue to remember him throughout the whole day. And prayer is actually very, very important because did you know that right after the very first pillar, which is to believe in God, the very next pillar is prayer. And we believe when we die, that is going to be one of the first questions we will be asked. So prayer is our second pillar. And if that second pillar was missing, what would happen to the roof of that house, which is Islam? Anybody? It would collapse. Okay. And did you know that the key to that house is prayer? So if you look at that key, it's got five little dents in it, which is the grooves are the five daily prayers. So to unlock that house of Islam, we need our prayers. Very, very important. Like um, stomachs need food or cars need fuel, your soul needs prayer. And that's the only thing that will satisfy our soul, okay? And you cannot have a life full of materialistic things without satisfying that soul. And this is why, like I said, you get all these like millionaire people, pop stars, and then they're committing suicide because they're not happy. Money doesn't buy happiness. We know that, don't we, already? Okay? And we believe in the Quran, it actually says, by the remembrance of God do hearts find rest. Hearts are assured by the remembrance of God. So they are my heart pills. Um, so we were actually made to worship him and our souls, they actually feel guilty when we do not fulfill that promise. A lot of Muslims don't know this either. Um, so when God said, pray five times a day, do you think anybody would have bothered? Is that a difficult task? Come on. <laughs> I like a bit of interaction in my talks. Uh, can I interrupt your first statement? Okay, we'll do questions and comments after. I just want one answer. When God said pray five times a day, everybody, do you think anybody would have bothered with that? 75, 75. Do you think they would have bothered with that? Yes or no? no? No. Five times a day. Who's going to bother with that? Sorry, I can't do that. Straight answer. I can't do that. Okay. So what do you think needs to be in place in order for us to make it easier that we can play? Pray. Think of school. Your teacher comes in and says, right, you've got five lessons, everybody. Just get on with it. The children are not going to do it. What does the teacher need to put in place in order for the children to do their five lessons? Let's have the lady at the back. A timetable. We need a timetable. You do this first. Uh, you have literacy in the morning. Then you have a break. Then you have numeracy. Then you have lunchtime. And then you've got another two lessons. Now the children are more likely to do it. So we have a timetable. And it's really nicely structured. So we are then more likely to do it. Others, who's going to bother doing that? Okay. So I want some of the non-Muslims to tell me, when is the first time when we pray? Okay. Yep. Good. Dawn time, just before sunrise. The next one. Midday. I want English names. This is for non-Muslims, this talk. Midday. Anybody else? Let, I'm looking over here at the non-Muslim. Okay, what is that? Afternoon? Okay. Yes. So afternoon is next. And then dusk. Good. Now we're getting there. And then night. Okay. Now a lot of people say to me that's far too much. Okay. But I have worked in two Church of England schools. Early in the morning. 
we pray in assembly. We pray again at lunchtime. We pray again in the afternoon before we go home to thank God for a lovely day. And then in the evening, a lot of those children will pray before they go to bed. So the only one left is first thing when they wake up. So it's not that difficult without a timetable. In fact, it structures a whole day. It actually makes a busy life makes prayer harder. A busy life makes prayer harder, but prayer makes a busy life easier. Because what we do is we slot all our activities. So, for example, we've got to do this, this and this. We had to hurry Mike along so I could get in before it's our evening prayer. You see, so it structures the whole day and we get a lot more done because we know we've got to do this before this and this before this. It is actually a wonderful system and it gets rid of our stress levels because we don't slack. We're, we're going along like clockwork the whole day. Um, without prayers, we're at a loose end, to be honest. We're not organized at all. It helps to organize ourselves. Right, we've got our timetable, but we may still forget. What else has God given in Islam so we don't forget? We may forget in our busy lifestyle. What else do we have? I want some Muslims because they called to prayer. We gave a call to prayer. Well done. The call to prayer, just in case we may forget, comes out loud in Islamic countries. You can't miss it. You feel guilty. Who's been to an Islamic country and you feel guilty when you hear that prayer? You just want to go and you just want to pray. So um, did you know that a mosque is actually dome-shaped so that the echo of the prayer goes around the whole mosque, everywhere and outside as well? It was actually a natural loudspeaker because in the days when Islam came, there was no electricity, no loudspeakers. So that is why a mosque is actually dome shaped and did you know that sound waves of that call to prayer that activate your body cells and you become energized and then you're ready to pray you become really really um awake alert okay so i am going to put a little bit of that call to prayer on which you can hear but you will hear the new one i mean you will hear the real one <laughs> and you'll all be awake but I'm going to put a little bit on because it's got a video showing the everybody rushing to pray. Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. Allah Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah Okay so um I don't know if you notice that sentence that's actually the first pillar of Islam so by going to pray we're actually fulfilling the first pillar and the second so our actual First testament of faith is actually in the court prayer. Um, then we would go and wash ourselves. And we actually believe we copied the previous messengers. If anybody here has seen the film Jesus of Nazareth, and in that film, even as a child, I remember Jesus going outside to a fountain and he washed his face and his hands and his arms and his feet. And I remember asking my mum, mum, that's what we do. And Jesus is doing that in that film in Jesus of Nazareth. So we believe that that makes us respectful to stand in front of God. And then we can pray wherever we like. But if there is a mosque nearby, you get extra blessings going to a mosque to pray. And you would dress appropriately. So I've got two models here. <laughs> if you can come and uh, to the front and show us your outfits on what you would wear because you would not come to the mosque wearing tight jeans or, um, you know, you get those um, trousers and they hang off your bums. You would not wear those in the mosque. So you would be fully covered in loose clothes so that, you know, 
their, their bodies are fully covered, like Jesus' robes, if you like. And that is actually a skull cap, which is a very ordinary skull cap that you would wear when you come to the mosque. This one is a bit more fancier, because this is more for somebody, for, for a Friday, for example. So you can wear whatever you like as long as you're fully covered. Not many bright clothes, normally flame colours. And the lady at the back, if you can quickly stand up just to show your outfit because you're all in black. Quickly stand up. And that's how a woman would uh, come to the mosque very respectfully, dressed in plain black. Um, that is a sign of a practicing woman the way she is dressed. Right, you can go and sit down now. I might be using you all later. <laughs> um, this is actually a, a plain white one. Which is the normal one that lots of men would wear. And this is like what Jesus wore. This is actually a little child's one. Sarah, did you want to come to the front and just show this to everybody? Come on. You're not shy, are you? You're not shy. Come on. There you go, hold it up. Yeah, hold it up. That's it. Okay. And let's have Daniel as well. Let's get the children involved. The children, when they come for their little school here at the mosque, they all dress up in these. What well, is the length specified? Um, yes, they need to be a little bit higher than training on the floor. Because in the olden days, the, the children wear them shorter. They can if they are. Yes, no, a little bit shorter, above the ankle. But let's give them a clap for joining in. That's very good. And um, the lady at the back can take some photos. As well. Okay, and I'm just going to show you something else. So, here is a headscarf that she would wear. I'm going to pop this to show you because you've got your hat on like this and it's a little bit glitzy for a girl and I've got a Terry style one here. <laughs> Let's pop that one on and show you. So there's so many different styles as long as you do cover your hair when you come to the moss. So that is a different style. There you go. Okay, brilliant. Let's give them a clap. They've done well. Right, okay. Now, we face the direction of Mecca to pray, because if everybody in the whole world is all facing the same direction, all at the same time, then it promotes brotherhood and unity. And you would normally get a Qibla sign. This is one actually that my son designed for a prayer room in his school. And he designed that, I put that up there. And um, an imam would usually lead the prayers um, and the ladies would be separate. So if you look at the way I've designed the mosque today, we've put the men on that side and we've put the ladies on that side. In that way, um, you are concentrating on your prayers and not on anything else, okay? The postures of our prayers as well, they're in such a way that it's not appropriate for women to be in front of the men because of the bending and some of the postures, I will talk about that in a minute, is, you know, with the head right on the ground and things like that, okay? Um, sometimes there's a, like a little gallery in the synagogue and the ladies would be um, up there as well. It depends on the layout of the mosque, okay? Um, we do have a prayer mat to pray on. So this is a like a handbag style. This has got a um, compass on it so that we know which way to pray at home. But in a mosque, the carpet is laid in such a way that the minarets of these dome shapes face towards left, which is the center of the year. So that is quite interesting one. And I'm gonna ask Daniel and Sarah again to come to the front and show them some children's prayer mats. Oh, you're over here. You can hold that one up. That's a really nice, glitzy, pretty looking one. You? So children at a young age would be expected to learn how to pray, um, even though they may not pray at that age, but we try and get them younger because 
Try telling a teenager to pray five times a day in Arabic. It's not going to happen, is it? Okay. Well done. Off you go. Let's give them another clap. I'd like to give you one today. <laughs> right. Okay. We pray in congregation and it's a set prayer for a reason. There's a big reason for that because I can say to God, I prayed for a slim body in the morning, okay? I prayed for chocolate in the afternoon. I don't need to do the other two prayers. Why do I need to bother? There's nothing to pray for. It's a set prayer which makes us do it. We have to do it then, don't we? Okay? But we do have a little bit at the end then when we can ask for our purpose. It's a set prayer. And again, it's very, very rhythmic and it's very, very well structured. We pray directly to God. We do not pray with any intermediary in the middle. So we don't pray to any prophets or any people. We pray directly to the one true God, Allah. And we believe prayer is the world's greatest wireless connection. Um, and why do our prayers, why are they done in Arabic? I'm going to ask a Muslim person to answer this. My first language is English. Why would I do my prayers in Arabic? I was born in England. I'm British. Yes. Because, uh, that's what, uh, that's what it's the called. original word of God. Yeah. And in that way, we're not changing the words. That's Good. It. What's the other reason? That's it. Language yeah. So yeah. say, for example, you watch a film in uh, like Shrek in French, it doesn't come out the same. The atmosphere, some of the words are not the same. You, you don't have the same word in another language. What's the other major reason why we will say in Arabic and not in any other language? Mm -hmm. Do you want to pop your hands up? Yes. Yeah. Unity. Everyone's saying the same thing. The same it is that thing. as well, but there's something else. So we were repeating the Quran? No, because we've had that already. Come on. Yes. Um, does anyone mention prayer done with these words in the Quran? We've done that already. What's the second reason why we pray in Arabic? No. No. It's beautiful rhyming poetry. If we translated the language to another language, the rhyming would go. Because you can't always find a rhyming word that means the same in another language. It doesn't happen, does it? So I want you to listen to the rhyme of this Quranic ayah, the verse. This is how we start our prayers each time. Allahu Akbar. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا Did you hear at the end of each verse it said in, 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 and then at the end it said amin. What's amin, everybody? Amen. Amen. Yes. So, what do you think that verse of the Quran may be in English? I'm looking at the non Muslims here only. Amen. No, the whole of that verse, that chapter that we start our prayers with each time. What do you think that might be in English? I'm telling God with his prayers. <laughs> not quite what is that chapter in English the Lord's Prayer I want you the non-Muslim to answer that it is the Lord's Prayer well done okay so the first chapter of the Quran is actually the Lord's Prayer which is the the, the prayer which Jesus taught us which I learned actually by Afaha as a child Right, the postures of prayer are really interesting because they are like yoga, okay? 
So each position gets rid of negative energy. <laughs> oh, I like to put a bit of sense of humor in my stuff. Flexibility of all parts of the body decreases tension, decreases tightness. Arthritis is reduced because of all your you know, joints moving around. And like yoga positions, each position is scientifically proven to get rid of negative energy. And the best position is when we put our heads on the ground because that removes the negative electromagnetic charges um, from the ground. So the different positions of prayer like yoga have recently been scientifically proven to help remove electromagnetic charges. The latest research shows that the best way to remove negative charges is to put your forehead on the ground facing the center of the earth. Okay, and then at, by the end of prayer, we feel calm, de-stressed and content. Okay. Yes, but also the electromagnetic charges, which is something you're asking at the other mosque and their mom didn't know. And I answered the question. So also a non-Muslim, did you know, got someone to come around to position their bed head uh, rest towards Mecca. So their head is facing there because it helps with aches and pains. So that's an interesting one. At the end, we do then talk to God ourselves. We express our emotions, our worries, our problems. We cry in front of him. And that de-stresses us completely. Um, it's like a free counseling process where you're constantly talking to God, offloading all your negative feelings, your anxiety, worries, anger management, releasing all your emotions. And we thank him. When we thank him, oxytocin is increased when expressed, when we express gratitude to God as well. So very, very interesting. So prayer is an exchange of, uh, is an amazing exchange. You hand over your worries to God and God hands over his blessings to you. Now, something really interesting, very recently, there's been an article out talking about emotions, which are linked with um, your body organs. And did you know that your emotions, if they're not released, they affect your bodily organs? So all of these anger, grief, worry, stress, fear are released through prayer. Then at the end, this is like rosary beads. We can use those as well. Rosary beads are there to um, remember God. They're just like uh, Catholic beads. We can use those as well. In the remembrance of God, we can praise him. So um, prayer is actually the best treatment for all the social, moral, spiritual, physical, and hidden diseases. You take five capsules every day. And uh, there is actually this talk on my YouTube channel, which is about the health benefits of prayer, which anybody can have a look at. And it's really, really interesting. It talks about all the medical and health benefits prayer has. So. Yes, I do in that one. Yes, yes, you can have a look. Um, and then the, there's so many different types of prayers. Apart from the five daily prayers, there's one special prayer, which is done on a Friday. And uh, the midday prayer is different from all other prayers because it includes a sermon. Okay, so that brings me to the end. Thank you very much. Ashadu an na Muhammad can we have the rest of the men or the boys to come and 
Thank you for taking your seat. We're now ready for our third illustrious speaker, which is our rabbi oh, don't you from the Romford and District uh, Synagogue. So I welcome Rabbi Lee to give us our uh, listen to the talk on prayer from the Judaism point of view. And let's welcome him now. Thank you very much. Good evening. First of all, I must, uh, must apologise that I'm not able to be with you. Um, my health is not as, uh, as good as it could be, so I need to take things easy. Okay, so prayer in Judaism is um, is a very beautiful and, un and unusual history. The bulk of our prayers are actually what we call PUT, which is basically poetry. It is written by Haitanian, by poets, and what it was, was that the prayer was initially written before there was such a thing as pen and paper available to everybody. There certainly was no printing around, and so it was all done off by heart. And so the, the, the poets would um, create these poems, and they would go round to various communities and they would conduct a service and the service would be them singing their poems and what they would be would be that they would they would adapt their poetry to whatever week of the year or whatever time of the year they happen to be so for example this week we will be reading from the Torah Genesis continuing chapter 6 going through to chapter 10 roughly and it's the story of Noah. So the poetry would be about reward and punishment, doing what God wants, helping other people, that kind of thing. And it would all link in to the story of Noah. And it would draw its material from whatever range of knowledge was around at the time. So you had, in order to understand the prayers, you could not just get a basic translation. Any of my Jewish congregation that are there, you can't understand your prayers from a basic translation because it means absolutely nothing. You have to have a thorough knowledge of the entire Bible and all the Midrashim, all the rabbinic explanations, and then be able to use a little bit of poetic license so that you can fit different ideas and different phrases and quotes from all over the place into a rhyming poem. And this was a tremendous skill that these people had. And the only way that they actually found their way into the, the Bible, uh, into the, the, the prayer book, would be that they had become accepted by the general public. If the people enjoyed the prayer and they wanted to say the prayers more often, then they would learn them and eventually they would just become common prayers and they would find their way into the liturgy. And this is how prayer really began and it's how it built up. And even to this day, although unfortunately the vast majority of this poetry has been lost, most of our poems is certainly on the most important days of the year. Most of our prayers are these ancient poems. And so, as I said, to understand them, you have to know the, the source of where they're coming from and what they're referring to in order to be able to appreciate what you're saying. So you're not just standing up and asking God for something or, or praising God out of whatever moves your heart. There's something much more deep behind it. And the, the word for prayer, actually in Hebrew, means to look deep inside yourself and criticize yourself and actually teach yourself. It, it's actually a moral lesson in how you ought to be behaving. 
And so what you're supposed to do in prayer is have an introspection of your own behavior. And then think to yourself, I'm asking God for something, but do I actually deserve it? If you think to yourself the answer is no, don't expect your prayers to be answered. You know, we don't have such a thing as a nice God. You pray to him and he gives you what you want. There's no such thing in any religion as a free lunch. If you want something from God, you've got to be worthy of it. You have to earn it. And so our prayers are structured in such a way that you have to sit there and have a self-introspection and see if you are worthy of what you're asking for. And if you're not, be honest enough to go away and change, become a different, become a better person. Now these sorts of prayers leave us because we have the hindsight of, of centuries of history with many questions dilemmas and one of them is that we will often have opposing prayers there is one prayer in which we sing every friday night which asserts our belief that god does not have a body and it comes from one of the 13 principles of faith written by Maimonides but on a saturday morning we will sing in a different prayer the fact that not only does God have a body, but Moses actually saw the back of God's head. And this comes from a midrash, from an explanation of the rabbis, of the ancient rabbis, into a portion of the Bible. In Exodus, I think it's chapter 26, or no, chapter 31, in which God and Moses have an, an interaction. It's shortly after the golden calf. And Moses is trying to get God to forgive the people. And the Bible actually says there that, that God says to Moses, you're not going to understand me altogether. You're not even going to be able to see me face to face, but you're going to see the back of my head. What do we do with opposing things like that? Our answer is that because we are so far ahead, so far on in our history, our liturgy becomes a history lesson as well. And so we can remember that we've actually theologically gone through a process of change. There have been times when we have believed that God has a body and there are times that we have not. And so when we actually say that there are principles of faith by which you must believe, and one of them is that God does not have a body, you have to remember that's only been since Maimonides. It's only been the last few hundred years. Before that, there was no problem with it. And so remember why this theological change has come about. And remember your history. And it is in itself a fantastic lesson. So prayer is only man-made. Even the bits that we quote from the Bible are only chosen by man to be prayers. They're not given as divine instruction. So can our prayers actually help? Well, there's a beautiful story. This happened many moons ago in Highbury. For all of you who are great football fans, if you remember the days when Arsenal played in Highbury, and it was a very particular evening, which unfortunately, for all us Arsenal fans, we will never ever forget. Because the football score was Arsenal 1, Manchester United 6. Now, in the VIP box, on that evening, was the Most Reverend Dr George Carey, the Archbishop of Canterbury, and Lord Jonathan Sachs, the Chief Rabbi. And they'd been invited along because everybody knew they were ardent Arsenal supporters. And someone turned up to them and said, if you two can't ask God for help, what chance have we got? And Lord Sachs turned to the guy and said, listen, sometimes the answer is no. 
we don't know if and when God answers prayer. We can't know if God answers prayer. But we can demonstrate the faith and the trust. And scientists have actually proven many a time that people who have that faith and trust and people who do use prayer often recover from illnesses much quicker. They find going through this much easier because they have this tremendous faith which gives them a hope and an encouragement for their future. So we can't, but we can't really know if prayer helps or not. And so when you pray to God, does God actually change his mind? We don't know. Is it futile to ask God to change his mind? The answer is a definite no, because, and this is one of the opening prayers of our New Year liturgy, there is a story in the Midrash that Rachel, the wife of Jacob, was supposed to be giving birth to a daughter. And the Midrash says that when she fell pregnant in her womb, there was a girl. But because her older sister had already given birth to six boys, and that all the boys were going to become the tribes of Israel, she became upset to the point of being distraught. And therefore, to save her that pain and anguish, God got into her womb and swapped the girl for a boy, and Leah gave birth to the girl, and she gave birth to a boy. Now, whether you believe it or you don't, the idea there is that on the new year, when we are actually praying, asking for everything we want for the coming year, we are being told before we even start our prayers that prayer is worthwhile and God has got the, the, the power to change his mind if he wants to. Whether you believe it or not, it's there and it's put into the most important prayers of the year to try and encourage you to pray. So how does God choose between one prayer and another? We don't know. We can't know. All we can do is have that faith and that trust. Our prayers are not just for the needy. They're for absolutely everyone and anyone. And we also have prayers for the dead. Now, why do we bother praying for the dead? Surely it's far too late. Once you're gone, you're gone. You've had your life, you've done your life. You're paying for your life on the other side. The answer to that is, and this is something which is pivotal in the whole purpose of prayer, is that we do not get our lives measured by what we've actually done. Our life is measured by the influence we have on other people. Hence, one of our prayers on Yom Kippur, on the Day of Atonement, is that we ask forgiveness for sins which we've committed that we didn't even know we did. Why are you asking for forgiveness for something you didn't even know? The answer is because actually, if you have caused someone else distress or be, to be misled, you are at fault. And sometimes you might not even realize that you've done it. But you can't turn around to someone and say, you didn't die from passive smoking. If they did, they did. Passive smoking means that somebody else smoked, they inhaled the smoke, and they got lung cancer from it. It's a pure and simple fact. And so what we have to appreciate is it's not just what we do in life that counts. It's what we cause. And they don't even have to be somewhere to be a cause of good or bad. We can even be dead. 
But if it can be seen that we have been the cause of good, even after we have died, that's still counted to us as if we have achieved it. And therefore, in praying for the dead, we are demonstrating that the dead are still having a positive effect on us. And therefore, in some sort of a way, they're still alive. And therefore, we're reminding God they need to be taken account of. These are the kinds of, of very powerful lessons that we get from prayer. It's never to be just an act of praising God, honouring God, thanking God, asking God. We're not robots. There's something far, far deeper in it. But where it comes from is itself not even from God or even from the rabbis. It's from the individual's inner soul. And so, yes, there is this great debate going around that one of the worst things that's ever happened to Jews in the world has been the invention of a printing press. Because now we've got an authorised daily prayer book and the prayers are there and we don't need to think for ourselves anymore. And this leads us to the danger of being robots, of not praying properly. Just as we, we have this saying in, 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 in Judaism that uh, you, know, you, you do something without thinking about it, you're just reading the alphabet. You, know, you read the alphabet, it means nothing. You can read a prayer and it means nothing. Prayer isn't the words on the book. It's the influence that it has on your mind and on your actions. And so we have the dilemma of people getting too frustrated to be able to keep their language clean and keep their thoughts serious. And therefore they need to be guided in what to pray for on the one hand. And on the other hand, having these thoughts and desires and needs, which they're bursting to get out of themselves, but they can't because they can't find the words and the words are not there for them. And this is the dilemma that we face in prayer all the time. And I think this is, I think it's somewhere, I think where the Christians have got it better than the Jews have got. Because Christians don't have a, a we've got a prayer book, we've got hymns in it, but you can go to a church and a, and part of the job of the priest, correct me if I'm wrong, is actually to formulate prayers. Rabbis don't have that luxury. We've got to go and read what's read there already. And it's not always helpful. And so I always say to people, if you want to go and pray, and there's nothing in the book for you, close the book. Open your heart. But remember, that you're not just there to plead and to ask and to honour and, and to sort of demonstrate your belief in God. What you're actually there to do is to tell yourself that if you want God to answer your prayers, you've got to deserve it. And so actually there's no point in going to a synagogue, praying and walking out and going, well, I better start being a good boy. Do we really need you to have become a good boy first? Then go into synagogue, turn around to God and say, look, I'm changed. And here I am, a different person. Be kinder to me. And be kinder to the people around me. Because what happens to them affects me as well. These are just a few thoughts in an in, in, in absolutely massive, massive topic in the, the idea of prayer. Thank you all very much. Okay, I'd like to welcome now. Dr. John Lester is our chair of the Henry Newton Forum. And next, the uh, Lester speaker, I'll pass you over to <coughs> Dr. Lester. We're in the Baha'i faith, prayer is, of course, vitally important, as it is in all religions. And uh, we regard prayer as a conversation with God. We talk to God, and uh, he replies, not, not, uh, Sort of way you can literally hear, but uh, you must then go ahead and take your prayers and answer them in the past. It's the answer. We have many, many prayers um, revealed by 
floor. Rabbi Lee, there's a question on the floor. The question <laughs> is, uh, praying for the dead, does it benefit them from people that are alive? Uh, does it reach them, the prayers? Does it benefit them? Do you pray for them? <laughs> And yes, I dealt, with that. I dealt with that in my talk. It certainly does, because the idea is that people do not, people's lives are not measured by what they do. They're, they're measured by what they influence on others. And so praying for the dead is in itself something of a positive, because the, the, the fact that somebody has died and you are praying is, is something that which is they have caused. I know it sounds a bit of a funny one, but but certainly you can pray for them if you're able to, within your prayers, say that they have been a positive influence, or you can demonstrate in your life that they've been a positive influence, and therefore they deserve to be credited for what you have achieved. Okay, thank you. Uh, there was a question in the audience. Uh, uh, I'm not really sure. I'm not, a, I'm not a religious scholar. I'm a medical doctor. Uh, but uh, in our prayers, you know, five times we pray. Uh, which means uh, uh, descendants of Prophet Abraham. So the descendants of Prophet Abraham are Christian and Jews. So we are praying for them five times a day. So Christian and Jews equally every day, they are, they are on to for their peace, for their salam, for their happiness, for their blessing. I don't know if you can correct me or if I'm wrong or what. I'm not a reason Any other question? I think that hand at the back was first. Um, this question is for the whole panel, but I was going to. Ask Mrs. Naim first. Um, you're saying basically the special prayer, okay? Is it uh, to do the most important thing uh, in the whole year, the level of product, basically, when you have to stay up all night? Um, who's coming to this world and who's due to leave this world? Yes. Um, basically, Laila Turka, there is a special night. It's in Ramadan. This is just for the non Muslims to explain. Um, and um, it's a night when our, you know, so many things happen on that night, so many blessings. And we believe that uh, our prayers are, you know, very strongly um, answered on that day. Um, we also believe in destiny as well. God, we want our destiny for, the, for that year, coming here on that day as well, um, things like that. So, yes, that is a very holy day. Because we believe that that's the day on which the Quran came down, which was the word of God to mankind. So that day is a day when most likely our prayers would be accepted. But that doesn't mean they won't be accepted at any time. Um, we also believe there is a specific time every day when God comes down to the first heaven, which is um, just before dawn time. And we also believe if we pray then as well, our prayers are most likely to be accepted. In fact, there are seven times uh, which are specified in our religion when our prayers are most likely to be accepted. So there's so many. One is when you are fasting, is one. One is while you are traveling, and things like that. But that is actually more of a question for, you know, it's a scholarly question, not a really an interfaith question. It's specific to Muslims, that question as well. My question is, so in Islam, there is the compulsory prayer, which if we don't pray, it becomes simple because we're in connection with Allah, of course, as you may call him. So my question is, in, in your religions, um, is prayer or worship, as I like to call it, is, it, is that compulsory aspect that you have to do, otherwise you become sinful, or is it just optional, the more you do, the more first you become to God? Um, that's, a, that's a very good question, actually. Um, I remember one phrase which I was so impressed with in my very first church in Dartford, just across the River Thames. And it was one week without prayer makes one week. W-E-A-K. Now, I think that applies to the Muslims as well. 
it applies certainly to the Jewish faith. My mother's of Jewish descent, so I know a little bit about that faith as well. Um, I do believe if we don't pray, our effectiveness, our faithfulness, our obedience, our tendency to, 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 to be more sinful, because I believe as a Christian we're all sinful. And uh, as a Christian, we, we obviously believe that Christ has saved us from that sin, uh, as God has saved us from that sin, because uh, we don't differentiate Christ, the Holy Spirit, God the Father is one God. Uh, we don't believe in three gods, as, as some tend to think. It's one God with three persons, uh, one which we know in the person of Jesus, one who is within us, as Paul says in, in um, one of his writings that the Spirit of Christ is not in you, you are not his. And by that he means God, because God, Christ Jesus and the Holy Spirit, is God. And uh, so if we're not in communication with him, I'm married. If I don't talk to my wife, it's a recipe for disaster. She's got a black belt in, in origami for start. So I'm going to have to learn very quickly after listening to my wife. I'm a father of a six foot two son. I can tell him off, but I can't do anything about it if he, if he ignores me. We've got to communicate. And that applies to God the Father. If we want to live lives which are to his honor, to his glory, we have to be communication with him. And that's regularly. I love the idea of five days and five times a day prayer, but I would add 10, 15, 20, 30 times. Because when I drive, I need to pray that many times, I can assure you. Uh, but prayer is so important to be disciplined too. And that's why I, I, I'm, as I'm the Interfaith Network representative for my generation nationally. And I have utmost regard for so many of that group because of their desire to pray and to be in communication with God. And yeah, I'm totally without that. I'm glad to think that uh, say in Brent Scott you sing, but uh, I say the parents, but I'm afraid that I'm here. Um, but it's a matter of um, basically, I think we want to say if you you said about are they are they commanded, but we have the ability to them by and it's obviously a place to all the special bits of the writings of all of us. Um, so that's what we're supposed to do. Uh, if you don't do it, then you, know, you don't do it. But you're more likely not to have that sort of feeling of that you get with prayer. It's, it sort of soothes you. Sort of, it sort of arms you down. It helps your spirit. If you don't say the prayers, then your spirit is not quite so, so uh, calm down, as it were. It's, it's, it's a matter of uh, feeding the soul. Um, it's great for the soul. And, I mean, building up our spiritual arms and legs in this, so the next one will be very sort of complete. Okay, yeah, in, in Judaism, uh, religion is actually not about God. It's actually about the way the human being behaves. It's about the way the human being behaves in a godless um, human materialistic world and so what we need to do is constantly remind ourselves of what we're supposed to be concentrating on what we're supposed to be using the world for and what is supposed to be our aims and purposes in life and because there are so many natural distractions we need to stop and remind ourselves of what we're doing. And so first thing in the morning when we wake, we pray to remind ourselves to devote our every action in life to God or to the way God would want it done. When we go to sleep at night, we are to reflect on the day and also importantly to remember that the night time is also for pursuits that would please God. A bang in the middle of the day, when it is just the most inconvenient time of all, we stop and pray. 
And the idea of that is to stop in the middle of the day, grab hold of ourselves, and think if we are being put off by all the distractions around us. And so it's not the, necessarily the point that we need to be devoted to God all the time. It is that we need to be turning the world into somewhere suitable for God to be. Somewhere that where we actually bring God in. And that is why there is this necessity to pray. It's because we have to accept that we're human beings, we have our fallacies, we have our failings, we have our limits, we're easily distracted. And so to stop us being distracted, we need to make time to realign our minds with what we're supposed to be doing. It's an acceptance that we're just human beings, but nonetheless, that we need to be devoted to something far more far higher, far less selfish than pure human endeavour and human desire. When you were doing this speech, you said something about Allah who is It sounded like Allah who but it's not Allah who Allah 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 so it's much the same, yes. The other, the other thing that Baha'i say is Ya Baha'u'llah Pah, which is O Thou Glory, which is an invitation to God. Very similar, yes. Yeah. 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 I don't say it in any other language than in English, but in the Lord's Prayer it says something very similar. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Very similar to what those two versions of the same thing. It's coming up to nine, so I think uh, if there's no more answers, uh, I think that, uh, dealt, it looks like the speakers are dealt with the final question. So I think I'd like to thank everybody for coming. Have a safe journey home, and God bless. It's time to close up uh, in a timely manner so we can uh, come again next time. I think in the meetings run on time. So thank you very much for attending. Thank you very much, Rabbi. We we're going to switch off from here now. Pleasure, lovely. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.